Today on The Grave Talks, the haunted Moss Beach Distillery. Who is the woman in blue who lingers at the haunted Moss Beach Distillery? What would make a person continue to linger in the same spot for more than half a century? Paranormal investigator Lloyd Auerbach joins us to discuss the woman in blue who has made herself known to patrons of the haunted Moss Beach Distillery and restaurants for decades. We hear about the multiple ways she has communicated with the living and how she even managed to change her dress from the other side. We even discuss the principles of paranormal research and the surprising discoveries that Lloyd Auerbach has made about what is truly behind many supernatural experiences that have plagued thousands over time. The property itself was built, as far as we know, um, what what we've gotten from the historians in 1926 as a private residence. But shortly thereafter, it was purchased by a Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area restaurateur by the name of Frank Torres. And it was converted into a restaurant, a grill. And he also purchased a hotel, uh, which was a small hotel, which was in where the parking lot actually is today. The hotel burned down in 1957 in a not so... Uh, unexplained fire. So it was it's not anything to do with the paranormal. Okay. <clears throat> the uh, the restaurant itself, because Prohibition had started, was one of many places here on the West Coast that was a speakeasy. Uh, although when, when you say that, of course, you conjure up images of Chicago speakeasies, which are either underground or hidden someplace. This was quite out in the open. In fact, the restaurant sits on a bluff uh, right looking over the over Moss Beach, actually, and over the Pacific Ocean. So it's, it's an obvious place in some respects. Mm-hmm. Frank Torres <clears throat> made his place very popular, uh, according to some locals who remembered that far back. It was a fun place to be. There was a piano player. They had dancing, uh, a lot of drinking from the illegal booze brought down from Canada. In fact, the beach below was one of the beaches on the Northern California coast where they, the smugglers actually landed to bring booze in. And the place was frequented according to local reports by people such as Fatty Arbuckle from Hollywood and some other Hollywood folks who would come up the coast to go to San Francisco. It was host to people like the governor of California, according to some reports, and the mayors of San Francisco, Oakland, and San Jose and surrounding towns, as well as the police chiefs. You know, prohibition was not a popular thing in many parts of the country. And consequently, because of their clientele, the place itself was never raided. There was never a report of that. Although later through our process, we learned that there were three raids on the Smuggler's Beach below. Mm -hmm. In around 1929 or early 1930, a young woman started working in the hotel and then frequently coming over to the restaurant after work. And she became known as the blue lady at that point because she always wore bright blue clothing. Uh, She started an affair with the piano player, Charlie. And then uh, the story is that she had left her abusive husband in the Midwest fled to the Bay Area and eventually down the coast to Moss Beach. Just so you know, a placement, the town is just a little ways south of San Francisco. So it's not far from the big city, so Mm -hmm. to speak. So one night, her husband showed up and tried to get her out of the place. And the story that we have from the locals and through one of the local historians years ago was that he was promptly ejected from the restaurant, from the place. I mean, it's a speakeasy, so there were plenty of bouncers around, most likely. Sure. For whatever reason, later that night, uh, the woman and her boyfriend decided to go for a walk on the beach, which people often did uh, in the evening, so weather, if the weather was not foggy. And what we do know is the next morning she was found knifed in the back, um, most of the the information we have indicates that that the piano player, her boyfriend, was unconscious. There were a, a couple of locals who had.
had heard that he had actually been scared off and ran away. But that doesn't really jive with what we what we know from other sources. And then within a few days, uh, a woman in a blue dress that was bloody was seen on the beach. And then the blood disappeared very quickly. Just a woman in a blue dress. A couple people recognized her as the blue lady. Um, in fact, a lot of the, the customers didn't know she was dead. They just saw this woman down on the beach. And eventually, over the next few weeks, according to the reports, she was seen <clears throat> coming up the beach, coming up the hill on the bluff next to the restaurant, and eventually in the restaurant and in the hotel. And so most of the occurrences since 1930 have been were visual until around the 1970s for that after the 1970s does she simply disappear or is there other occurrences of her interactions she seemed to get a little more physical in the 1970s and like i said for for the most part and i i've talked to witnesses who had seen her in the 40s and the 50s uh even in the 60s and then in the 70s a couple by the name of uh, pat and dave andrews bought the place and ended up living in the space below the restaurant, which originally was a garage and then was turned into an office and then it was turned back into an apartment for them, apartment and office. These days it's an actual office for the staff. So uh, Pat and Dave reported that while there were still sightings of her, uh, that especially Pat seemed to end up with a bond with her because she suddenly became very helpful. Pat reported a number of instances where uh, she would reach for a pencil or be looking for some writing implement and it would just simply pop out of the pencil case, uh, you know, the pencil holder or out of a drawer. There was one time she said she was couldn't find her checkbook and she was seated at the um, office desk and the checkbook floated down from a high shelf above her where her husband had put it. So there were a lot more physical things happening at that point. Otherwise, people reported seeing her. Uh, one kind of common thing was in the ladies room women would see, would be looking in the mirror and they see this woman in blue standing next to them and they turn and look and there's nobody there. And of course, then the image disappears. Or they'd be alone in the ladies' room in one stall and they'd hear a woman giggling in the next stall, even though there's nobody else in the ladies' room. Uh, other folks saw, have seen her outline um, in with along with Pat and Dave Andrews' experiences in the office, the Tiffany Lamps, would occasionally start swinging on their own. Uh, chairs would move on their own. Glasses would, would slide across the bar. All playful stuff, according to the witnesses. When an entity like that goes from being very visible with many stories of the full-bodied apparition or, or not, it, or just even, oh my God, that there's a woman out there, not even realizing it's an apparition of some sort. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and then where it almost tapers down a bit, her story continues and, and she's interacting in other ways. What do you think that is? Is that something that, and this is obviously just an opinion-based question, but obviously sure. you know the world well. Uh, is it something where over time do you see things like that where where the the apparition slowly fades yet their energy is still there and interacting and maybe it's just kind of one of those things where over time the ability to show themselves in such a strong fashion fades for lack of a better term well first of all it's important to know that when people are seeing the apparition that they are not seeing the apparition with their eyes okay it it is a, it is a, a connection a psychic connection okay uh, and it, it seems to rely on the entity more or less thinking thinking out, broadcasting, if you want to put it that way, okay. the, the image of themselves uh, in the patterns that we have of apparitional experiences. And there's thousands and thousands of them uh, on the books in, in my field in parapsychology and psychical research. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> People are seen as apparitions, not necessarily the way they look when they died. Uh, I think The Sixth Sense got it wrong. The movie The Sixth Sense got it wrong. People are rarely seen with that bodily damage. She was seen with a bloody dress for a couple of days and then no blood. Uh, And people who die at a very advanced age, when they are seen as apparitions, they look in the prime of their lives or look healthy. Mm -hmm. So it's it's more about a person's self-image. And even the clothing that they're wearing can be dependent on their self-image. In fact, with The Blue Lady... My first experience there was an investigation done for Japanese television. And we were working with a Japanese medium. She was the center point for the for a series of, of specials that I worked on. 
And she had a conversation. <clears throat> One of the things that she did the first night was she had a conversation with the blue lady. We got a couple of names. We got a, a first and middle name, Elizabeth Clare. No last name at that time. And Mrs. Gibo uh, <clears throat> had a sit-down discussion with the ghost about her experience. Uh, we had not filled her in on some points of history. In fact, it was very hard for me to dig up. Uh, only through some of the locals, it had not been publicized, so it would have been would not have been information she had anyway. And she confirmed it based on what the ghost was saying. But then she pulls out a fashion magazine and starts flipping through the pages and pointing pointing to specific uh, dresses and fashion, showing it to an empty chair, which is where she said the ghost was sitting. Within a couple of weeks, I got a call from the restaurant saying, "We think we have another ghost. There's a young woman here." in a black cocktail dress uh, and more modern jewelry, according to witnesses who have seen it. And when I went down there and talked to a couple who had had many, ex many visual sightings of the ghost, and even the woman he actually claimed, she was a neighbor, she claimed that she had conversations with her. She said, um, and this was actually in a subsequent conversation I had, she said it's the same woman, and then in a subsequent conversation she said, oh, I had a conversation with, with the ghost, and Mrs. Gibo ch told her how to change clothes. So she's not been seen in her blue clothing for many years at this point because she learned how to change her clothing mentally. As far as the physical stuff goes, uh, it seems that that's rarely an instant thing for any apparition. Uh, even apparitions that only stick around for a few days typically have no physical power, you might say. No, no ability to do mind over matter because that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, in some cases, it takes a few months and things might move, but most apparition cases have no physical activity. Uh, for whatever reason, she decided or she figured out how to do it, and she decided that's where she should put her energy rather than being seen by people. Although she's, st she's still seen by people who are very psychic. Yeah. That's very interesting, and it's it's kind of one of those. It, it, it it's it's an aesthetic thing, but it, it's something that we we talk about on both of our programs somewhat frequently. Is how one is seen once they've passed on. Is it the clothes they're wearing when they die? Is is, is it right. a younger version of them? There's all these variations because we hear so many stories from everything of someone's looking like they got mangled in a car wreck as a ghost, uh, all the way to it looks like the younger version of themselves, and they look pristine and. and wonderful in it, it's an interesting way of thinking of this uh of it's it's more so them the entity the ghost the spirit um understanding on how to project themselves is that what your is this what is that what this, it kind of comes down to is that what you're saying it does but i will also point out that not all things all figures that are seen as as ghosts are actually conscious mm -hmm. now there is that imprint factor too sure um, and that's a lot of them. So a lot of the ones which, which are people are seeing someone who's been knifed or dead or shot or there's um, mangling in an, in an accident. Some of that can be the imprint of, of the event sure. or the location. When it comes to seeing a full bodied apparition uh, like that, uh, you had said earlier that it, it's not necessarily visually seen. It, it's right. oftentimes someone. Well, it's, it's definitely not. It's definitely not an optical thing. Sure. That's, that, we know that. Oh, that's my question about that. Does it take, because the way I describe uh, sensitivity levels, it's almost like a one to 10. I, I, I kind of feel like it's a sense that really hasn't been uh, extremely understood or recognized yet. Some folks can hear frequencies that at the dogs can hear and others cannot. Um, right. I, I kind of look at, at being able to be sensitive and empathic uh, along those lines to a certain extent where some are at a 10 where they can literally see people that are not there that or that are there that others cannot see and they can have the conversations and, and everything of that nature all the way down to the one where that same person walks into the room and they just kind of get an eerie feeling um and, and sometimes i think there's zeros as well where they're just completely not attuned to it so when it comes to seeing a full-bodied apparition is that something uh, in every case where you at least need to be somewhere on that scale to pick it up, to pick up an apparition, or can a, an apparition appear to anyone of, of the apparition's choosing? Well, as far as the second point goes, we're, we're not really 100% sure about whether the apparitions get to choose who they can broadcast to. And the fact is that not everybody perceives things psychically, visually. Sure. Uh, I have never seen a ghost. I have felt... I've been, in fact, I've been patted on the back and had my arm squeezed on the USS Hornet. 
I have felt the presence of the woman at the at the Moss Beach Distillery. I have smelled cigar smoke when somebody connected with me who was deceased. Uh, so we have olfactory apparitions. We have auditory experiences. We have the visual ones. We have combinations of those. So it's it's how we process information coming in cyclically. I don't process visually psychic information. I suspect it's because I'm a very visual person otherwise, which would kind of override that perception. So I get it through other, other perceptual versions. Mm -hmm. And so that's one part of it. <clears throat> Another part of it is that people, people's beliefs influence how this information comes to the surface. So people who are disbelieving tend not to, they may be all this really psychic themselves, but they tend not to have the experience. And in testing we've done in the laboratory with <clears throat> what are called sheeps and goats, so people who are believers versus people who are true disbelievers, it's really interesting that the true disbelievers will score significantly below chance. In other words, they'll unconsciously be able to get to know the answer and guess wrong on purpose so that there's no evidence for, they think, for ESP. In fact, it actually is evidence for ESP. Mm -hmm. So there's that element of belief that comes in here as well. And then it's not necessarily the ghost choice of whether the percipient, the person who's getting the signal, processes it at all. Uh, so it, it may be a level of ability. It is a perceptual process. I mean, a lot of people may actually experience the blue lady but they don't experience her visually. They may feel a presence and not even know what that actually is. Mm -hmm. That's that's very interesting what you talked about with the, the individuals who are more skeptical or, or not believing in this. Just this last weekend, we did an event at the Crescent Hotel in uh, Eureka Springs, and most of our audience that came, very big believers in the topic. That's why they came across the country there. We had about one gentleman who came up to us who was very skeptical on, on everything, but mm -hmm. I, I swear had some of the most convincing ghost stories of, right. of, of things that had happened to him him but still it was always prefaced with yeah but i'm still not quite sure about it and it's it's almost like well what will it exactly take <laughs> to convince you right. there's something else going on and that kind of led me to a realization too because there, there's sometimes where I, I, I'm on the, the mindset of, well, if you're not open to it and you're not believing in it, uh, maybe you're not going to experience it. But I think there's many times where people are not open to it. Uh, they don't believe in it, yet they experience it very frequently, but still will not accept that there's something else sure. going on. Well, we have an interpretation. Yeah. Um, you can write things off in your mind, sure. second guess yourself very easily. Mm -hmm. And people do it all the time, especially when it comes to physical object movement. You know, the the idea that something could be moved right in front of your face without any motive, apparent motive force is an alien one or run right out of science fiction or horror films. So from our societal perspective, the way that we are educated and basically brainwashed <laughs> culturally is to believe that this is not possible. So we will ignore it. Uh, and people have ignored things quite a bit. There, there was a great story by Isaac Asimov, who was himself a total disbeliever in psychic abilities. But I wrote this great story called Belief, where a physicist suddenly realized he could levitate himself. So in the story, he goes to a physics convention and he tries to get people's attention and he levitates himself up and down from the audience to try to get the speaker's attention. And the only attention he gets from the speaker or anyone else is the speaker saying, well, the guy who's floating in the back, please sit down. I'm trying to do my presentation. <laughs> so there's this bias that we have <laughs> that often hits us on many levels, consciously and unconsciously. Um, and sometimes it doesn't take much. There's another case that I had uh, where there was a lot of physical activity and it was well known the place was haunted. And I, the owner had told me that two, two guys came in, at the, sat at the bar and were basically um, ridiculing the concept that there was a ghost there. And saying that they were making it up and the whole bit. And apparently they each had a beer in front of them. They had their change for their for their cash in front of them. She saw this a quarter in front of each of these two guys stood up by itself on end, just as balanced like on the edge. Mm -hmm. But it simply flips up. And she said they both turned white and ran out of the place. <laughs> And probably had some sort of explanation that they came up with later, later on. Too. They probably, when they realized they left all their money on <laughs> yeah. the bar, they probably said it was a trick. Yep. 
and you know something like that and they got conned or something and they'll never, never go back again sure yeah. sure going back to the haunted moss uh beach distillery is the lady in blue was she the first reported haunting at that property Yes. Okay. Uh, first, and not necessarily the only, there have been a few other people that have been seen. Um, at one point, a young boy was seen, and then a guy, a, a, an older man was seen. So, But going back, you know, the place didn't exist before 1926. Mm -hmm. So if there was anybody being seen on the beach, we don't really have any reports of that, certainly. Let's talk more about the encounters that have happened uh, with the Blue Lady, more I even in, into to present time. What are some of those stories that uh, individuals have, have had there? Well, one story, <clears throat> which was really interesting before I, c I came over to the place, uh, you know, again, there are a variety of um, experiences. So there was one where there's a liquor room downstairs and it's against the hill and there's no no entry point other than the door and one of the folks was going down to get something from the liquor room and boxes of liquor turned out to be stacked across uh, against the the open door from the inside it took them quite a while for a couple of people to actually shove the stack of boxes away from there there was just simply no way for it to, for anyone to actually do that it's kind of a locked room mystery in some respects. Mm -hmm. When I was there with Mrs. Gibo, the Japanese medium, she, I guess because she gave fashion advice, the ghost was, uh, became very playful and cooperative. And Mrs. Gibo asked the uh, blue lady to do something for our cameras. But before she did it for the cameras, uh, she did it for everybody. So Mrs. Gibo described the blue lady walking over to the back door of, of a new, newly constructed dining room which had a push bar door it was it was actually not finished yet the room wasn't finished yet and there was no handle on the outside door you could use a key but nothing on the outside and we all watched as the push bar went in and the door opened up slowly and then closed so the japanese crew got their camera there on the inside they should have actually had somebody on the outside too i put somebody on the outside to make sure that the crew was not screwing with us and we watched several more times as the door did exactly what had just happened uh, my colleague who was on the outside started laughing. She said it was like it was the weirdest thing in the world to see a door open on its own when it was not electronic or, or set up in any other way. Mm -hmm. There were, again, the lamps at the bar <clears throat> moving back and forth. There were um, in front of three people at the hostess station, a chair picked itself up and flipped over, did like a 360 in front of them. A uh, commonly reported thing by employees and even customers when the bar, when the whole restaurant would shut down at night, they all the lights would be turned off. People would be talking in the parking lot, and they'd see the lights turn back on one by one inside the restaurant. And on a couple of occasions, witnesses would report seeing the outline of a woman in, in the in the window as well. Uh, there was uh, often flying, but but not breaking glassware. So glassware that would fly around without breaking. That's been seen even re relatively recently. There was. Um, for a time in the 80s and 90s, repairmen, people who were or people who were working in the kitchen, usually not the chefs, but some of the maintenance people or the people who were cleaning up either before or after or getting the setups ready, if they were bent over, they often got whacked on the rear by a spatula or a frying can frying pan when no one was in the room. <laughs> no one else was in the room, and that happened with plumbers. It happened with a lot of other folks. Uh, there was a time when this a lot of the stuff is kind of like shifted. It, it seems like she gets she does a set of physical things <clears throat> and then she moves on. She tries something else different. <clears throat> and for for a time, the phone lines would ring. The internal phone lines would ring when there was nobody on the other side. And they had a pay phone for quite a long time. We don't see those anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and the pay phone would ring like shortly after the internal phones would ring and there'd be nobody at the other end. And the phone company actually replaced the, the phone a couple times and said that the last one that was there, you could not call it. There was no physical way for it to ring. Mm -hmm. And it was still ringing as if someone it was, was still ringing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So there were a whole bunch of different things. Uh, they centered in different parts of the restaurant. They centered in, in even around the place uh, and kind of very playful. And it's always been very playful. Sure.
How do you prepare to go into an investigation like that where you, there, there's so much lore around it, so many stories from so many different people? Uh, what is it to, like for you as a researcher and investigator when you begin your journey into a location such as this? Well, first I'll say that we rarely do um, public locations. I mean, if the owner of a restaurant calls me and wants me to come out, I'll definitely do that. But I don't seek out, like so many ghost hunter groups, we don't seek out public locations. Sure. Uh, it's just not, it, it doesn't really fit. Plus, because there often is so much folklore and it's hard to find witnesses, um, the process in parapsychological work is to have witnesses. If we do not have witnesses of current events, all we have is a ghost story that we can take down the information for. There's not, literally nothing to investigate except history at that point, history and folklore. Uh, we don't drag psychics into places that have had no reports for years. So I've actually been called by people who are restaurant owners or folks just generally in their homes. They had a sighting two years ago and they just heard about me and they now want an investigation. It's like, has anything happened in the last six months? Well, no. It's like, tell me your story. There's nothing I can investigate. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's a cold case sure. with, with no resolution other than possibly telling you what might have happened. So preparation for a place like the distillery, since um, how I got to the Moss Beach distillery was because Japanese television I was doing a, going to be doing a series of shows with them, and for each of the shows, they wanted to take Mrs. Gibo to a research lab to be tested in some parapsychology experiment. She was a psychic medium, and then also take her to a haunted place. And f I was looking around for places in the Bay Area, and one of the places I found by looking in various books was the Moss Beach Distillery. Now, I the first thing I did was I called the owner. Uh, besides asking for permission to shoot there, I needed to get some background besides what was in the various ghost books, you know, Ghost of the Bay Area or Ghost of California type books, which I did look at. <clears throat> and I wanted to make sure if I could find any news articles or anything I did research in that area. Uh, I was fortunate to have access to a news database called Nexus, which I still have access to, which covers a lot of news. This is prior to the Internet, of course. Mm -hmm. Uh, and also talked to uh, one of my students had had worked in the uh, newspaper morgue at the San Francisco Chronicle. So she did some background research for us there as well or any previous sightings. So I was able to actually get some good information on the reported sightings and get an idea of the footprint of this story <clears throat> out there. The um, owner had just bought the place like a year before he came from the telecommunications industry he bought this place. He did not believe in ghosts when he first bought it, although his daughter was one of the witnesses to that liquor room situation with the boxes of liquor. And she had had a couple of other experiences there, too. He just kind of wrote them off as, you know, fun or whatever. But since he had bought the place, he'd had some odd things. He'd witnessed some odd things himself. And his staff had certainly told him about some things. So he was he was open to it. And I got I set up a time to, to speak to several of the wait staff. Um, after hearing his story, I did that as well. Um, he flat out asked me about you know, having the TV crew there. He did not know whether or not he should. And he really honestly asked me, is this going to be a good thing for my business or bad? And when it comes to haunted restaurants, the key element is really, is the food any good? <laughs> because no one's going back to a haunted restaurant if the food's not good. Sure. So th thankfully, this is one of the better restaurants in the Bay Area. So that was not a problem, which made it good for me because then I got a free meal at a good place. <laughs> exactly. I love restaurants for that reason. <laughs> so um, going there, so we did some phone interviews, then did the in-person interviews with people uh, before the crew, the TV crew did their interviews with them. So the key was really to get as much of the current events and past experiences people had to look for patterns. That's how we go in and prepare. Uh, for this particular one, we brought in magnetic field detectors. I had some temperature sensors. Honestly, <clears throat> when it came to when it comes to actual conscious ent entities like the Blue Lady, it's really kind of their choice as to whether or not they're interacting with any of the equipment. Anyway, mm -hmm. just like for a living person, if somebody tries to take a picture of you, unless you're unaware, uh, you can always step behind the camera. 
So you don't you go, don't get a picture taken of you if you're careful unless you allow yourself to unless you're candid. When it comes to communicating with the dead, and, and specifically in, into this case, there's obviously today you watch a ghost television show and there's a, a thousand pieces of equipment of, oh my gosh, look how accurate this conversation yeah. is we're having with the ghost. Um, now, let's let's pull things back into reality and, and true investigative work. Um what do you believe there is today? Because obviously there, there are new pieces of equipment. Some may provide uh, some more insight than we've had 20, 30 years ago. But in your opinion, what are some of those ways that exist to communicate uh, with the dead that, that you would consider to be somewhat accurate that exists today? None of the technology. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, all right. So first, let me just say that the reason that we've even we even started the very reason people are using magnetic field detectors, EMF detectors, mm -hmm. is because of people like me. In fact, I'm credited with being the or I guess credited or blamed. I'm not sure which one <laughs> with being the first person to use a tri field meter on camera on TV. But they didn't give my full explanation for why I was even using it. OK, <laughs> which is pretty typical. So the reason we use things like temperature sensors and EM sensors of varying types is to look for changes in the environment or patterns in the environment that connect to people's experiences. So an unusual magnetic reading, even if we can't figure out, you know, first thing we do is always try to eliminate the sources of technology and electrical stuff around. I have found more bad wiring in homes with an EMF meter than I've ever found anything to do with apparitions or hauntings. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that those that that field is not causing people to be possibly more psychic. It's just that that the entity is not causing the field or the change. So we're trying to figure out if there's a correlation between people's people's experiences and what's going on in the environment using a variety of environmental sensors. And. Yes, we do. And we might ask, can you make it go up and down? Can you approach the device or not? But I, I got to tell you, one of them, the natural tri field, which does look for uh, minor changes in the natural electromagnetic fields around, which is a device you really can't move around because moving it around causes changes, like moving your hand through water causes a wake. That device is really interesting in that living people can also set it off. So just like I could ask an apparition, to please come over to the device and make it set off, go off, I could have asked one of my colleagues, could you please walk over to the device and set it off? Sure. So we have these, these elements that we're not really sure causally what's actually happening. And then you add in the technology for supposed communication. And let's face it, EVP is old. It is not new. Mm -hmm. There's nothing new about electronic voice phenomena. It's been around for decades, many, many decades. Yep. People have been trying to get... Uh, discarded entities, dis apparitions to influence or affect devices. However, we also have a huge amount of data that shows that living people can affect electronic devices. So as we've gone digital into the digital age uh, and the way things are set up these days, it's very difficult to know who's actually causing that EVP if it's actually intelligible, if you can actually understand what it's even saying. Mm -hmm. With cassette recorders, there was always the potential for picking up the sound of its own motor and picking up CB radio in the 80s and early 90s. <laughs> yes. Uh, which was a lot of fun <laughs> to have people give me a lot of ghost trucker EVPs. <laughs> uh, so some of the other devices, you know, there is nothing that has been has really demonstrated true communication with apparitions other than living people than human beings. And I'm not just talking about psychics and mediums. Uh, I'm talking about the witnesses themselves. It it bothers the, the heck out of all of us who do this work when the TV shows dismiss the witness testimony as anecdotal evidence and focus on the technology, which has no meaning behind it whatsoever. And in fact, they're dismissing the experiences of witnesses, which is the thing that brought them to that location to begin with. Mm -hmm. I mean, to say that the witness testimony is worthless how in the world would they know it was haunted otherwise? I mean, how is that place even labeled haunted if living people didn't have an experience? 
And the answer to that is if it looks spooky or it was an asylum or a prison, it must be haunted, which is not a good reason to do an investigation. That wraps up part one of our interview with Lloyd Auerbach about the haunted Moss Beach Distillery. In part two of our conversation, we'll ask Lloyd if he believes there are accurate ways to communicate with the dead today. Can unskilled investigators make a haunting worse? In the world of parapsychology, what does a ghost family tree look like for Lloyd? Does it just contain the spirits of the once living, or are hauntings ever sourced by something that never walked the earth? Can the living be the source of hauntings? And what does Lloyd think about locations that seem to disappear, not the ghosts of people? Until next time, I'm Tony Bruschi. Thanks for listening.